So far this semester, we've learned a lot of different ways to help plants grow. We know that the duration of light or the quality of light, uh, the media that we use, uh, the nutrients that we add can all affect how a plant is able to grow and develop. Uh, plant growth regulators, sometimes called PGRs, are just one more way that we as horticulturalists can use our understanding of plant anatomy and physiology to help plants develop in ways that we want. Um, unlike nutrients that are coming from the outside, plant hormones, phytohormones, or PGRs, plant growth regulators, um, can be made by plants themselves in different situations and in different parts of the plant. For example, auxin is always present in the very tip, the growing meristem of plants, which is why we can remove it by pinching back plants. We also have synthetic PGRs. Um, we have things that we can spray on plants um, that mimic different plant growth regulators or these hormones that plants create. Um, as well as mask them so that they aren't um, able to do uh, or send the signal to do uh, what plants, um, you know, what that hormone controls. So these PGRs uh, we can use to start growth, stop growth, modify the uh, bushiness of a plant or the lateral growth of a plant. We can break dormancy or make seeds more dor dormant. Um, there's five known plant hormones that are typical. There's, there's more than that that are known, but these are the five uh, that are they're typically used in the horticultural industry. I will say that um, there are some that are used a lot more than others. For example, uh, rooting hormone uh, contains plant growth hormones, and that's something that we typically do use for um, uh, cuttings whereas we might use cytokinins only in tissue culture uh, and, and uh, micropropagation. Uh, ethylene gas is typically used uh, post-harvest, so uh, it has to do with the ripening and maturity of fruit, uh, whereas we might see abscisic acid used primarily in seed, um, seed production and seed treatments. Um, so these hormones, while they're naturally present in plants at different times, um, they are manipulated in our industry in different ways. Auxins, which are contained in the tip of the plant, are associated with stem elongation. This is what tells a plant, um, hey, you need to grow as tall as you can, as fast as you can, so that you can crowd out the other plants so that you can get enough light. That's actually kind of an anthropomorphized view of it, I guess. So plants aren't necessarily competing consciously with those plants around them, but if you're the tallest plant, chances are you'll get the most sun. So auxins control what we call uh, apical dominance, that apical meristem, that tip of the, the growing shoot here, uh, to grow upwards. It's produced in the tips of the plant and it can uh, migrate. It can go from cell to cell to cell. Um, when we pinch back the top of that, we get rid of that uh, need for a plant to grow uh, as tall as we can. And instead, another hormone, cy um, cytokinins, that are, are produced in the roots tell the plant to, uh, to grow bushy, to grow lateral branches instead of... Um, the apical one. Another cool thing that um, auxin is responsible for is phototropism. In our experiments with photosynthesis, we saw how plants will bend towards the light. This happens because as that auxin is sent cell to cell to cell, it's telling each of those cells uh, to elongate, remember, to grow up. Um, but if one side gets more of that than the other, then they're not going to grow at the same rate. So if this side grows faster than this side, right? It's going to end up curving. We see this because um, that, that auxin is actually uh, photophobic, meaning it moves away from the light, technically, and so there's more auxin on the side that's shaded, and therefore the shady side grows longer, and the side with auxin, um, without auxin, um, or with less auxin, uh, doesn't grow as long, so we see that bending. This was actually an interesting experiment that Darwin did. So if you pinch off the top of your plant, you should see its response to light delayed, an interesting experiment that um, you won't have to do today, but it's a fun lab for the future. Uh, another thing that auxin is responsible for is a plant's ability to sense gravity. Look at this coleus here. See how it's been laid down on its side? Now, even if I put, um, now light um, has an impact, but plants also are able to sense gravity uh, so that they know to grow up. And so again, that auxin moves to the lower side and that creates uh, that, creates that curvature that we see. In gravitropism. So auxin is a pretty busy, um, busy little hormone there. Here's some Nicotiana, some tobacco. And again, we're seeing that the auxins are telling this plant to grow super tall. And if we were to cut that down right here, we would be removing that auxin, at least temporarily, until that new meristem can develop and start secreting that auxin. And in the meantime, we begin to see that auxiliary growth. And that's why that pinching back, that removal of the terminal bud, is removing the auxin 
and in doing so it creates um, bushier rather than taller plants. Oxen is also very important for root development and um, so in a lot of our cuttings that we do um, we use a synthetic form of oxen in order to dip our cuttings into to create and initiate root. Um, there's actually natural forms of oxen, um, for example, in willow trees in the genus uh, Salix, uh, they produce a lot of oxens naturally. And so if you uh, needed a cheap and organic rooting hormone, you can take little um, pieces of stem from um, willow trees or shrubs and cut them up and soak them in water uh, for a few hours. Um, and that's good for, you know, a, a fair amount of cuttings as long as you use it right away. So oxen is a very, very important um, PGR. Uh, gibberellins. Uh, gibberellins help stimulate flowering um, and there's synthetic forms of gibberellins uh, that we can kind of brush on to plants to help increase flowering. Now we can do this through light as we learn, light duration, long day and short day plants can help initiate flowering. We can also um, help encourage flowering uh, because of temperature differentials in the greenhouse. Um, we don't go into that in that class but daytime and nighttime temperatures and uh, how you manipulate those uh, can also encourage flowering, but you can also um, kind of paint on some synthetic uh, gibberellins to initiate flowering. Um, gibberellins can help with the initiation of germination, uh, and they also, similar to oxen, cause elongation. But specifically, gibberellins occur because of elongation in between the nodes of a stem. If you remember our stem anatomy, the internode is kind of the place on a stem um, um, that's in between where little buds or branches or leaves might form. Um, this is produced throughout the plant, uh, whereas oxen is produced in the tip. Take a look at these two plants. So gibberellins cause internodes to stretch. And this comes into play a lot. If you've ever left like a, a tarp on the grass for too long or a blanket, and you notice that when you pull back that blanket or tarp, the grass is, um, it's yellow, right? It stops producing chlorophyll, um, but it also, it also is really long and stretchy. Uh, much longer than the grass around it. Um, so with high light intensity, we don't see that kind of stretching, whereas in low light, um, the gibberellins kick in to help stretch the inner nodes. If you can think about it as a survival mechanism, the gibberellins are saying, hey, I don't have any light right now. I can't grow and I'm going to die without it. So uh, rather than putting my energy into creating chlorophyll, um, which breaks down actually really quickly over time, plants are continually making new chlorophyll, I'm going to put my energy into this gibberellin, which is going to cause my internodes to stretch so that I can get around this thing that's blocking me, um, like the tarp, for example, in order to capture the light. Um, in the problem, in the greenhouse, right, we can have plants that are too close together so they're not getting enough light, they're shading each other. And this results in um, weaker plants that break when we ship them. And so um, we have a product on the market, it's called B9, and it's a growth regulator that causes the gibberellin um, to stop. It inhibits gibberellic um, acid, uh, it, the gibberellins from being produced. And in doing so, instead of having nice, long, tall plants, we actually have more compact growth. And if you think about the appearance of a plant, um, you're not really buying it for the stems. You're looking at the foliage or the flower. And so uh, we use this sometimes in greenhouse production. Um, poinsettias are a good example, where instead of having long, tall growth, we've got nice, compact, bushy growth. Cytokine, as I mentioned, um, often work very much um, against auxins. Whereas auxins are produced in the tips, uh, the cytokinins are often produced in the roots. And their job is to push out lateral growth um, and also the formation of new cells and cell differentiation. So cytokinins we typically see in the use of tissue culture production. Um, this is often added uh, additionally and it can come naturally. Uh, for example, cytokinins occur naturally in things like coconut water uh, and things like that. Uh, or synthetically in a powder that we mix into this medium, to this auger, uh, in order to, to grow and repl replicate cells. Um, it can cause um, cell division, uh, and it can also uh, help cells decide what kind of cells they're going to be and help them dif differentiate. Um, so cytokinins, we, um, we don't see as much outside of micropropagation, but we are starting to see it. I'm seeing it in facial creams and wrinkle creams and things like that, um, because this plant hormone is associated with, uh, with cell growth. Um, so again, just kind of comparing cytokinins to auxin. If you remove the auxin from the top, the cytokinins kick in to promote lateral growth, um, whereas the auxins typically inhibit, inhibit the cytokinins, instead causing apical dominance for, for that plant to go straight up. 
Ethylene gas. Okay, so ethylene gas is the reason why you've heard that expression, one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. And that's because uh, ethylene gas is produced in ripening fruit. And what it does is it encourages ripening of others or senescence, aging, maturity. Uh, and so if you've ever had like um, green tomatoes, and we get those all the time in Colorado, it's October, the frost is coming, I still have plenty of green tomatoes. I can take my green tomato and because this is a gas, right, it's not like a chemical um, that's, uh, that's passed through osmosis from cell to cell. It's actually a gas that kind of surrounds uh, the parts of the plant, which is like the stems and ripening fruits and dying leaves of a plant. Um, it can be released and captured. So I take a brown paper bag, I put in my green tomatoes, and I throw in a piece of ripe fruit, whether that's another tomato or an apple or something. Um, this is actually used commercially. Um, so what this does is basically is it ages or matures a plant. It thickens the stems, it can break down chlorophyll, it can um, weaken cell membranes, it can soften cell walls, it can cause flowers um, to more quickly um, develop their fruits and that fruit to ripen more quickly. Now that's great if you want to speed up production, um, but senescence, particularly like in an annual, um, kills plants. And so it's great not to have like dead and dying plant material inside the greenhouse with others, not to mention pest problems. Um, but you can see a practical application actually. Here's another experiment just if um, these two plants here, you can see that quickly ripens. Uh, but there is a, an upside to ethylene gas. In fact, if you've ever eaten a banana, um, if you've ever eaten a banana, uh, chances are it's been ripened using ethylene gas. This is a naturally occurring, odorless, flavorless, um, very safe gas, but um, bananas. Bananas are like the leading fruit in the U.S. It's crazy. They've only been in the U.S. about 100 years. Um, great book about uh, the banana. I'll put on on our reading list. But um, bananas, if you ship them ripe, are going to be bruised and nasty. And so they're usually picked green and shipped um, unripened. Uh, when they get to a kind of a distribution center for groceries, um, they're they're put into kind of a sealed container where they uh, introduce ethylene gas, and that actually helps them ripen up quickly for market, so they don't have to keep them in storage. Um, the last one we'll talk about is abscisic acid, uh, and this is the plant stress hormone. And this is something that often kicks in to let a plant know that, hey, um, conditions are not favorable. For example, uh, an adaptation for a really dry environment might be to um, have a plant stomata remain closed during the hottest parts of the day. And so abscisic acid would be the chemical hormone that's like, hey, it's pretty hot here. You're going to lose water through transpiration if you open up your stomata, even to get the CO2 to undergo photosynthesis. So let's keep them closed. Why don't we? Uh, it also uh, keeps seeds dormant um, until uh, conditions are favorable for germination, such as temperature and moisture. Um, so again, with uh, growth regulators, plants produce these, but we also have um, uh, applications for them in our greenhouse. And so we've got um, synthetic ones for helping rooting. Uh, here's a couple of different um, industry brand names. Uh, and we've also uh, used them for growth retardants, for example, with gibberellins to keep plants compact or to like jib a camellia when you need something to bloom, you can apply it. Um, for the most part, the, um, the use of these can be somewhat expensive, so we don't typically see them outside of applications like rooting hormone, um, uh, unless you're in a fairly large commercial um, uh, environment. Here's some uh, things to keep in mind when growing them, and um, safety as well. Um, some of the synthetic uh, PGRs are, are not terribly um, good for you, so make sure that you're following safety applications should you choose to use them.